Yeah, one second. So we're concluding the presuppositional approach from five views of apologetics with John Frame. Okay, Caleb. Okay, yeah, just on what you were just talking about, I was just going to say it's the same. Uh, like if you look at scripture, like a Calvinist and an Arminian, they're looking at the same scriptures and they're interpreting it two completely different ways. It's like the same evidence. Yes. But different interpretations, just like with what you're talking about. And that's within the same broad worldview, but they're still going to have different presuppositions based on their theology. Fascinating. I posted something up, I think it was yesterday on my Facebook page, and someone said, is that Calvinist theology? <laughs> and I was just like, I, I didn't want to be too snippy, but I could have been pious and said, no, that's biblical theology. But I told them instead <laughs> that it was transcendental theology. And just because... I didn't appreciate someone trying to drag me into that gutter fight that I don't really want to be involved in anymore. I just, I don't care if it's held by Arminians or Calvin or Pelagius or Augustine. You know, I certainly want to see what the scripture says, but I understand my interpretation of scripture is influenced by so many different things. My life experience, my education, my, that's why I think without the Holy Spirit hermeneutic, the Holy Spirit, I really believe, has to illumine the scriptures to you. Otherwise, you're only going to read it through your human experience or reason or education or indoctrination. And But that's a super mystical approach of biblical interpretation. Is that what we teach you? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> We do not teach Holy Spirit hermeneutics, I don't think. Now, you might get it in Witten's class, because he's a bit of a mystic. Oh, sorry, we're recording. But yes. <laughs> he self-identifies as a mystic. Does he? Yeah, in the history of Christianity. Oh, good. Yeah, it's a mystic. I'm so glad. <laughs> OK. Well, the part I wanted to pick up with um, on page 217, John Frame is saying, this is halfway down 217. I'll, actually, I'm going to start up. So there's a kind of circle here, but even the circle, as I indicated earlier, is linear in a sense. I'm not quite sure what a linear circle is, but we'll go with it. For it is a movement from God's truth to the gift of faith to the reflection of God's truth in human reason. A more difficult question of what value is this presuppositional argument to the unbeliever? How can a Christian ask a non-Christian to believe in Christ on Christian presuppositions? Great question, John Frame. Um, the unbeliever, by definition of unbeliever, does not have those presuppositions. So how can he or she be expected to employ them in the apologetic encounter? Here are several points should be noted. And his first point is, faith is a demand of God. He calls us in scriptures to repent and believe in Christ. And then he gives us like four passages. God commands us to do many things that we cannot do in our own strength. To summarize, he calls us to please him in all we do. But apart from grace, none of us can please him at all. Similarly, the command to believe is one we cannot carry out in our own strength. It requires the grace of God. So in the present context, we may say, yes, the unbeliever cannot think according to Christian presuppositions, but that is nevertheless what God demands. And the inquirer will do so if and only if in the course of the apologetic encounter, God plants faith in his heart. The apologist can, know, can do no more than proclaim the truth, trusting that God will plant faith if and when he wills. Any thoughts on that? Mm. It, it sounds to me like he's saying, just go for it. <laughs> and if God wants to grant them faith along the way, he will. And if he doesn't, there's nothing you can say that's going to illuminate them. 
I mean, I would, I would agree with that. My my question on there would be is like, I, I don't see, I don't see the um, like in the New Testament or something when they're trying to share the gospel. I don't see them saying that or giving an indication that there is no common ground between an unbeliever and a believer like that you have to change their presuppositions before they can understand truly and he may get to that in his other points yeah he does okay but yeah it is true um the the command was to repent and, and believe, right? And it's interesting because Jesus even makes the appeal to the scriptures, believe because of what the scriptures have said, or if you can't believe that, believe it for the evidence or the miracle's sake, um, but believe, don't remain in your unbelief. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's look at point two. Um, the apologetic argument based on biblical presupposition conveys truth, and certainly the work of apologists is to communicate truth. If we abandon our biblical presuppositions, claiming a position of neutrality, then at that point we would be telling a lie to the inquirer. There is no such neutrality. And the very idea of neutrality is at the heart of Satan's deception of those who are lost. To claim neutrality is to claim that I am the one who ultimately decides what is true or false, that I am on the intellectual throne. Such neutralistic pretensions must be rebuked, not indulged. They are a form of pride of which God commands the sinner to repent. And I don't know about you, but it almost sounds to me like he's using neutrality as a synonym for objectivity. And I would agree, no one can be completely objective, but I also would say it's like a continuum. And we can try to become more objective and less subjective. And I can't imagine that that I would think that would only be helpful in an apologetic sense, where you're not just so single-mindedly seeing through your point of view that you can't even understand what the other people are saying or why they're having a problem with what they're saying. Yeah, I mean, he seems to be saying that since you can't truly be objective, you should abandon trying to be objective and wholeheartedly be subjective. If we swapped out neutral for objective, yes, that's exactly what he's saying. And I think I might be reading into it, but that's how it hit me. Thirdly, whether unbelievers admit it or not, God made them to think in the Christian theistic worldview as their presupposition. I don't know about that. I, I think maybe might need to get out more. And at one level of their consciousness, they do think that way. Remember that Romans 121 describes them as knowing God from the created world, yet suppressing that knowledge. So we may ask the unbeliever to think on Christian presuppositions, because in one sense, he already does. Our plea is that he drop the unbelieving presuppositions that dominate his thought and give heed to those principles that he knows that suppresses. Once again, from a Christian worldview, that makes perfect sense. But if you're not a Christian, I mean, could you, I've actually had atheists try to do that with me. They said, Fred, just set aside your belief in some sky daddy for a while and try to engage the world like this is all there is to it. And you'll see that he didn't add or take away anything from life. I couldn't do that if I tried. I, I live and breathe God. He's my constant companion. It's not like I can just be like, okay, Holy Spirit, take a time out. And I'm just going to go through life with my natural human mind. Now, don't get me wrong. I default into what I call the Fred show every day, where 
I'm just doing Fred things. So they could be good, bad, neutral. But outside of Christ, it's all meaningless. It's all dust and ashes. But when I'm in the spirit, when I'm conscious of who I am in Christ, it's powerful. It's transformative. Unfortunately, those are like flashes in the darkness for me. And then I'm back into the Fred's perspective. I think uh, I think there's like a little bit of truth to this one because if you look at a lot of the arguments that like atheists make and stuff, uh, a lot of times they're presupposing theism. Like, for example, uh, if they raise moral objections to the God of the Old Testament, then they're presupposing objective morality, which can only exist in God. Without God, there is no objective morality. So things like that. I think there's some truth to to what he just said there. Good, Caleb. Thank you. Um, and I do that with my atheist friends all the time, especially when they start condemning God. <laughs> I'm just like, based on what? Who says genocide's wrong? Who says it's wrong to pick some and condemn others or, or whatever, however you want to phrase it? Where are you getting that template from that you're making these value judgments? And he keeps pointing out without God, you become the sovereign of arbitration. You get to say what is real, what is not. And I mean, that seems kind of egocentric too, but people don't think of it that way, right? They think I'm being an independent thinker. I'm not being indoctrinated. I mean, this is like, are you? Where are these value judgments coming from? And they all tend end up being relativistic, right? Because they're coming from subjective individuals. And okay, good. Thank you, Caleb. I was having a hard time seeing it in that one, but that's a good that was a good one. I want to add some, you know, to there real quick. Yeah. I mean, this his argument in point number three there seems a lot like uh Craig in nat the natural theology that the classical view would hold. Yes. So, I mean, <laughs> I guess that just shows that these are quite quite a bit alike in their uh, apologetic methods. Yes. All right, number four. Um, knowledge suppressed creates contradiction in thought and life. Part of the unbeliever says that God's revelation is true. Part of him says it's false. He holds contradictory beliefs simultaneously with corresponding confusion in his decisions, actions, and feelings. The apologist should appeal to the part of the unbeliever that acknowledges God in spite of himself. To that knowledge, which the unbeliever keeps trying to suppress, we can do that only by reasoning consistently on biblical presuppositions. Can anyone think of any examples what he might be referring to? I mean, we already talked about kind of ethics and morality. Is there anything else? Like, that's another good example. I've had agnostic and atheist friends who've had their significant others cheat on them, and they're like morally outraged. <laughs> and I'm just like, why? Where do you get this idea that they should be committed or faithful to you alone? What's that all about? Probably because they were brought up in a Judeo-Christian home and those things kind of percolated into them, their subconscious. And even though now they're, they're actively agnostic or atheist, it, you can't just shed everything so easily. So I would definitely could see that for people that were brought up in a Western culture, um, but I don't know how that would be if they were brought up pantheist or what if you were brought up naturalist. Even naturally, though, have ethics. They're not amoral. It's just like most has to be sorry. based on supernatural. Go ahead, Caleb. Yeah, I was just going to say, I feel like most atheists, like from your ethics class, are ethical relativists. This is like, you know, they get all their morality basically from culture. So right. whatever our culture deems right and wrong, or in our culture, genocide is wrong. So that's kind of what they're appealing to, I feel like, most of the time. Yeah. So I'm not sure what else we could appeal to. Um, maybe a mother's care for her child. Um, 
self-preservation, really base root thing. I mean, these even apply to the animal kingdom, not just to humans. Like, why is that? Where does that come from? I guess our uh, evolutionists could just explain that it has to do with survival, passing on the genes. But. I think C.S. Lewis puts like a whole list of stuff similar to this in, um, in Christianity, um, like along similar lines. Like he mentioned the um, like the objective morality, and then he like a few examples of like, well, why is it looked down upon in every culture? to run away from battle when you're entering war, you know. Yeah. I forget all the other ones. Right, and and even though there is so much diversity in the world and in human history, there are universals, but they're gonna be broad. Right. Like every culture has a concept of modesty. How bizarre is that? Mm -hmm. Now, what that means could vary from wearing a string around your abdomen to wearing Victorian clothing, right? But every culture has a view of modesty. And that's really bizarre. Why is that? Every culture has a concept of right and wrong. Every culture has a concept of gender roles. I mean, now they vary what those roles are, but they all have gender roles. That's it. And I would but say- how much do they vary? Not too. But <laughs> yeah, Edward. Is it how much do they vary though? A lot, but they have the they still have the category in their minds. Which one are you talking about in particular? You said you said gender roles vary. Yes. Yeah, they vary extremely. Like. There are some cultures where the women are the hunters and the men stay home and take care of the children, even breastfeeding them. And I have video if, if you doubt me. <laughs> Wait, the men are breastfeeding before. the children. <laughs> it's on my playlist on my YouTube channel under cultural anthropology. That's actually possible? Well, they use coconuts, but still. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're in that role of nurturer, caretaker, as opposed to warrior, hunter. It's trippy. But it's, a, it's an exception to the rule, right? Mm. That's, but that's a huge spectrum. All right, last, last one, number five. Oh, wait. Yeah, number five. The apologist then may and should legitimately require the unbelieving unbeliever to reason on Christians' presuppositions. That is nothing less than the demand of God. But this demand may be made in subtle ways. One way suggests Cornelius Van Til is to ask the unbeliever to present his own system for analysis. Uh, there you go. The apologist <laughs> agrees to accept the unbeliever's presuppositions for the sake of argument for the purpose of showing that these provide no basis at all for meaning and truth. The Christian then asks the unbeliever to accept the Christian presuppositions also for the sake of argument. If the inquirer wishes, he may attempt to reduce the Christian position to absurdity, but we trust that he cannot do that. Well, I think I could do it. Thus indirectly, we display the necessity of adopting Christian presuppositions as our ultimate standard of truth and we communicate God's demand that the inquirer adopt these presuppositions and all this thought. But we present that demand subtly in a way that continues rather than terminates the discussion. It, it sounds to me like a version of Pascal's wager, wager in a sense. Like, let's assume your view's true where does that take us? Let's assume that my view's true. Where does that take us? I don't know. I just, I guess I'm missing the apologetic piece here besides it's the work of the Holy Spirit. Which I'm good with that. <laughs> okay. But I, like I said, I do like John Frame's tone. 
I like, um, I, I too am a presuppositionalist, but I mean something very different. Um, and I don't, I don't think people can just change their presupposition like we per, change a pair of glasses. Now I can do it as an intellectual exercise, but when I'm done doing that demonstration, I default back into my presupposition and worldview. But I think it's a it's a great intellectual exercise to practice, and I think it would make you a better apologist or evangelist if you actually had the ability to understand what that atheist or pantheist or animist was thinking. For one thing. When I was younger, I used to get into these huge discussions with pantheists, and we could talk for hours about God and creation and all that. And I'm just thinking, wow, we just seem to be so compatible. And then I realized we're not even talking about the same thing when we say God. Because, and that's part of being a philosopher, I'm such so adamant about defining terms. Because if you don't get people to define their terms, you literally could engage with them for hours or days or weeks and really not, and just be talking past each other. And so it's really important, I think, to it, it, ask an atheist to define God for you. You know, so you at least know what they're dealing with, what they're objecting to. It, it may not even be what you're trying to proclaim or sin. I would love to hear of, or, or good and evil, right? That's an exercise we do in my ethics class. I ask people like the first week of class to define good for me. And based on how you define good, I can tell a lot about you and your presuppositions. If you tell me there is none good but God, I'm gonna assume you're coming from that theistic camp. And if you say good is what's in my own self-interest, well, I'm going to assume you're an egoist, and you could be in any of those circles to be an egoist, actually, unfortunately. Okay. I'm done with John, with this one, if you guys are. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to end this recording. <laughs>